One of the other jaw-dropping revelations in these transcripts is the plan to fire Gina Haspel. I want to read this to, to all of you, and then we'll dive into it. Um, Alyssa Farah told the committee that Kash Patel was the CIA director for about 14 minutes. It has an echo to um, the coup guy at DOJ, uh, Mr. Clark, being the attorney general for a little longer than that. Um, this is the transcript from Alyssa Farah, quote, I will share one thing that I cannot confirm myself, but it's worth looking into. I've been told that they tried to fire Gina Haspel, the CIA director, and install Kash Patel. But Gina, who's a very savvy operator and an incredible public servant, already had what I call a suicide pact in place, where basically the entire intelligence community would walk with her if that happened, officially, like, or essentially decapitating the entire intelligence community. So they were able to stop it. But allegedly, for about 14 minutes, Cash was actually the CIA director. And I don't need to tell this to Congressman Schiff, but that man has no business being anywhere near intelligence or anything else. So all that is to say it was a scary period, and I'm glad I wasn't there for a lot of it. But I think you guys have a lot of threads you should pull. So, Luke, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Kash Patel is now an immunized has some limited immunity in a witness in an in, as a witness in the investigation into the mishandling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Um, he was, for 14 minutes, the country's CIA director. Right. Yeah, you're correct about his role also in the Mar-a-Lago case. And I think there are a lot of uh, echoes here of what happened at the Justice Department, where there was another plan in place to install Jeffrey Clark atop the uh, the Justice Department, another Trump loyalist. But again, there was a threat of a mass resignation within the Justice Department and terrible headlines and embarrassment for the Trump administration. And Donald Trump, uh, um, uh, at the end, did not go along with this. And apparently, he did not go along with this plan uh, with Cash Patel either. And I think if you combine this with the transcript from Johnny McEntee a little earlier in the week, it shows how there was a, sort of a loyalty test about who would go along with Trump uh, to, to the farthest length as to who could stay in office, because there were several people that were referenced by Mr. McEntee as having been dismissed when they were seen as disloyal. And in fact, there was almost like a loyalty test review of each individual, how loyal they were to Mr. Trump. You know, Kyle, what is it that you want to do if you want Jeffrey Clark atop DOJ and Cash Patel atop the CIA, what, what is it that he wasn't able to do that he would have realized with the two of them? Do we know the answer to that question? Well, I think you're talking about two different strands of the sort of cons conspiracy theory or the conspiracy, the, the, the multi less step plan to kind of subvert the election. And one of those involved foreign intelligence and questions that, you know, the really the, the most extreme versions and fringiest conspiracy theories about foreign uh, adversaries changing votes, even foreign allies changing votes. There were, you know, Scott Perry, the congressman, was texting with Mark Meadows about these ideas that the the Italians and the Brits were involved with trying to tra change votes with Gina Haspel as their ally. And these are these were just totally crazy theories uh, that were being thrown around. And I think. Uh, you know, you see, you know, how those played out, you know, that they, they, Trump was exposed to a lot of those and may have taken actions to try to pursue some of those questions. Um, and, and that may be why he looked at some changes that, you know, in the intelligence world, uh, he looked at those other changes at DOJ. And what we saw really was this resistance by the people who were running those agencies that prevented it from happening. Joyce, um, we also learned that Chris Krabs was indeed fired because he did his job too well that he declared publicly that the election was the most secure in America's history. So going back to Johnny McEntee's transcript, there's this entire theme of loyalty test, of Chris Krebs getting fired because he stood up for elections, of people at DOD who had to go because they didn't believe that Trump was entitled to invoke the Insurrection Act. 
And, and really what we see at this point, it feels so much less, Nicole, like telling the story of a presidential administration than it feels like when I used to prosecute organized crime cases, Dixie mm -hmm. Mafia cases, where so much effort was expended on trying to keep the truth from coming to light. So much energy was expended on getting people to obscure the truth when they testified so that no one could be held accountable. And now we're beginning to see some real holes in that armor and some of the truth shining through. And it echoes back to Jim Comey and his earliest comments where he had dinner with Trump and Trump asked him for his loyalty, not loyalty to the Constitution, but personal loyalty. And here at the very end, we see people like Gina Haspel at risk of losing her job because she was loyal to the country and the Constitution, not the president. For anyone who's not getting this point, it's not very subtle at this point in time. Trump was about Trump. Trump was never about America and democracy. Um, I heard Adam Schiff tonight say that he felt like the committee had reached everyone in the American public who was reachable, everyone who could listen mm. to the truth. And hopefully that message continues a little bit further as this evidence continues to come to light. Joyce, let me just follow up with you, because that act of firing Jim Comey was ultimately investigated by the Mueller probe as one of the acts of obstruction of justice. And I wonder, one of the crimes for which Trump was referred criminally by the committee was obstruction of an official proceeding. Are these acts also part of what will be scrutinized, scrutinized by DOJ as that obstruction? Um, so I suspect that DOJ, for whatever reason, has moved past the recommendations in the Mueller report. Many of them will be out of the statute of limitations by now. There's a five-year statute of limitations on prosecuting federal crimes. And perhaps hindsight will view that as a mistake. We know that Merrick Garland is very much an institutionalist, that he wanted to strengthen the Justice Department, that he didn't want to tear the country apart with cries that DOJ was political. And yet, at the end of the day, when we evaluate what the former president did, it cries out for legal accountability. And at every step along the way, we see how he skirts, sometimes very narrowly, legal accountability for his misconduct. And that's really, in many ways, what led us to January 6th. It's past time for Trump to face justice. It's so interesting. Every time he gets away with something, if you will, he escalates. The day after Mueller testifies, there's the perfect call with Zelensky. He dodges his first impeachment, and he starts talking about a rigged election. Um, that election ends, and he works on the January 6th coup. Um, it's just extraordinary, and it's wonderful to talk to all three of you. Kyle Cheney, Luke Broadwater, Joyce Vance, thank you so much for starting us off tonight.